It got real quiet. <laughs> Emily? All right. It's at last 9.30. Good morning. It's my pleasure to call this meeting of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. Today is Wednesday, um, April 13th, 2022. With us today are Commissioners Emily Lindley and Bobby Janeka, as well as our General Counsel, Mary Smith, and I'm John Nearman. For those who are joining us virtually, I'll ask you to please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking. For those who are making presentations, please wait to begin your presentation until I or our General Counsel have asked you to begin speaking. On items where argument or discussion is allowed, we will inform speakers of their time limits. Registration has now closed, but if you'd like to address the commission on a particular item, please email agenda at tceq.texas.gov with your name, affiliation, and the item that you'd like to comment on, and we will do our best to accommodate that request. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for being present, and Ms. Smith, I'll ask you to please call the first item. Item number one is the application by Jonathan and Laura Osinga for major amendment to Texas Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit number WQ0002959 The parties have been notified that the commission will not take oral argument but may ask questions and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. So for the benefit of those who aren't familiar with our process, we have a two-part analysis for considering requests for contested cases on TIPTI's applications. First, we consider whether the requesters have met the procedural and substantive requirements to be entitled to a contested case. And assuming that we have at least one uh, who has met those requirements, we then consider which issues to refer. So part one is about who gets a hearing, and part two is about which issues go over to SOA. Requesters who are affected in a manner different from the general public and who have articulated personal concerns that are relevant and material to the permit and have done so both in timely comments and a timely hearing request are entitled to a hearing. In determining who is an affected person, uh, we look at uh, the requester's statement of their personal concerns and their proximity to the regulated activity together with the nature of the authorized uh, discharge. And colleagues, in this case, we have Touchstone Ranch as the sole requester. Its request articulates personal concerns that are relevant and material to the application, uh, water quality among them. The ranch is located within a half mile or so of the facility, so um, it's my view. I think it's pretty clear that Touchstone Ranch is entitled to a hearing. Seeing no disagreement, um, I've identified the following referable issues. Whether the draft permit is protective of surface water and groundwater quality, whether it's protective against nuisance odors, dust, and vectors, whether it contains appropriate nutrient application rates, and whether the retention structures are designed and operated consistent with our rules. I agree. Likewise. Does sound all right? Um, and I think on this one, I would include an ADR referral and also afford the full 180 days for the hearing. I would agree. All right. Um, I can make a motion. Great. See if we're ready. I would move that we grant the hearing request of Tess Touchstone Ranch LLC and Tess Touchstone Ranch Recovery Center that we refer the matter to SOA for a contested case hearing on the following issues. One, whether the draft permit contains provisions sufficient to prevent nuisance conditions of odors, dust, and vectors. Two, whether the draft permit is protective of surface and groundwater quality in accordance with TCEQ rules. Three, whether the draft permit contains appropriate nutrient application rates in accordance with TCEQ rules. And four, whether the retention control structures used by the facility are designed and operated in compliance with applicable TCEQ rules. That we refer the matter to the Commission's Alternative Dispute Resolution Program to run concurrently with the SOA preliminary hearing scheduling efforts and that we specify that the maximum duration of the hearing is 180 days from the preliminary hearing to the issue of the proposal for decision. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item.
Item number two is the application by Continental Homes of Texas LP for new TPDS permit number WQ00159488. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument but may ask questions, and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. So colleagues, we have another TIPDES application, and again, we have a two-part analysis. Part one is about who gets a hearing, and part two is about which issues are referred. And again, in this case, we have a sole requester, single requester. Um, here, Florence Dew's concerns include the effects on water quality, human health, and animal life. Uh, Ms. Dews resides about three quarters of a mile from the facility, and, as well as uh, being adjacent to the discharge route. So I think this one's pretty clear as well. I agree with the executive director and OPIC that she's entitled to a hearing. I agree. Likewise. All right, turning to the issues, I would refer to uh, whether the draft permit has adequate provisions, including operational requirements to protect water quality, and whether the draft permit is protective of water quality and the existed use, existing uses of the receiving waters consistent with our uh, surface water quality standards. I agree. I'm comfortable with that as well. All right, I think we're about ready for a motion. I think I've got one ready. Um, as for uh, referral for alternative ADR. dispute resolution or timeline of the matter, 180 days, are we comfortable for that? That's fine. Sure. Uh, I would make the motion that we grant the hearing request followed by Florence Dews refer the matter to the TCQ's Alternative Dispute Resolution Program to run concurrently with SOA preliminary hearing scheduling efforts, that we refer the application to SOA for a contested case hearing on the following issues. A, whether the draft permit contains sufficient provisions to ensure protection of water quality, including necessary operational requirements, and B, whether the draft permit is protective of water quality and the existing uses of the receiving waters in accordance with applicable Texas surface water quality standards, including protection of the requesters and requesters' families' health, domestic animals, and wildlife, and set the hearing duration for the proceeding at 180 days from the date of the preliminary hearing to the issuance of the proposal for decision. A second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number three is the application by the City of Wichita Falls for water use permit number 13404. The parties have been notified that the commission will not take oral argument but may ask questions, and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. So colleagues, um, requests for contested cases on water use permits are a little different than our typical Senate Bill 701, um, sorry, 709 House Bill 801 requests. Uh, these requests, these, these water use requests, are reviewed under Chapter 55, Subchapter G, which directs the Commission to consider the relationship between the interest claimed and the regulated activity, the likely impact on the health and safety um, of the requesters, the likely impact on the requesters' use of their property and other natural resources, as well as uh, some jurisdictional factors. Requesters must, among other requirements, be affected in a manner different than the general public and articulate personal concerns that are relevant and material to the permit. Governmental requesters have, can have a right to a hearing if they state an interest or a statutory authority over issues relevant to the application, and associations can establish standing if the relevant issues are germane to the organization's purpose and if they name at least one member who would have standing in their own right. Um, so we have uh, a large number of requesters on this item. I have pages of analysis. I'm going to go through it, and I'll try to go through it slowly enough so that you can track it. Um, I would invite you to interrupt me if I go too fast. Um, or or if I came to a conclusion different from, from how you uh, came out, so we can just stop right there and work through it. All right, sounds like a plan. Um, let me start with a few of the easy ones. Um, I would grant the request of the water rights holders on the Little Wichita River in or near the reservoir footprint, and these are the city of 
Henrietta, Stan Horwood, Larry Horwood, and Johnny Shaw. Um, let me pause. Thank you. <laughs> Stan Horwood, Larry Horwood, and uh, Mr. Ms. Shaw. What was the last uh, one? Johnny, Johnny Shaw. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, the next group are property owners within the reservoir's footprint who, uh, in my view, have a clear personal justiciable issue. Um, I'll note that the applicant argument argues that the, these interests are not protected by the law under which this application is considered because they're precluded by judicial condemnation proceedings. Um, it's my view that if the land has been condemned, that's a fact that we would consider, but I don't see that, um, that the commission's jurisdiction is precluded. So having met the requirements under our rules, I would grant the following requests. Are you ready? I'll try to read these slowly. Deborah Clark, Emery Birdwell, Shane and Casey Cody, Laura Del Murray, Mark Hill, Lonnie Horwood, Carol Staley Morrow, Jason Obermeyer, Jimmy Dale Obermeyer, Kildevnet Castle LLC, Um Helil Valley LLC, Joe A. Staley, Phil Staley, Gil Staley, and William Wellborn. Okay, and I'll note that Laura Del Murray and Jimmy Obermeyer, who I just named, um, I don't think their initial request quite got them there, but they rehabilitated their requests uh, with their replies. Um, Sharon Fitz, Francis Klein Esler, and Edna May Klein, uh, who might belong to this group of property owners within the reservoir's footprint, didn't provide quite enough information about the location of their properties in relation to the inundation, so they left a, a question in my mind. Um, the same is true um, for Clay County Rural Development, so I would uh, refer all four of those requests to SOA for an effectiveness determination. I, th I think I'm fine with that. Um, so those four are Francis Esler, Sharon Fitz, Edna Maycline, and Clay County, just to? Uh, Clay County Rural Development. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah. Can I ask a uh, little more about the Clay County Rural Development? Was there a particular uh, member they claimed that they clarified in a reply? Uh, let me look at my notes on that one. I think I see the, uh, my analysis, my notes on Clay County Rural Development, there were some possible properties that, that they indicated they owned that could be in that inundation area. And I think from, from my cursory review, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't convinced they raised it that level, but I'm, I'm uh, happy moving along, when, particularly when there's a, a referral consideration going on, likely uh, as it is, so 
that clarifies it for me. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Commissioner Janek. Can you repeat your first question? Yeah, for yeah. Me? The Clay County Rural Development. I was just curious to hear a little bit more. And I, I'm looking at my notes. I see that there were two properties they indicated they they owned. The group owns that that could possibly be inundated by the reservoirs, the footprint, and I didn't uh, I didn't conclude that there was a, a good argument that. Yes, we can say that for sure, but uh, there's enough of an argument that that should be moved on to SOA to, to make that determination and ask the appropriate question. So I think I'm comfortable with, with moving them on for a referral as well. Okay. And I, I think there may have been some question about whether this was a, uh, an association or just mm -hmm. a requester, um, you know, kind of representing themselves in their individual capacity or their, or their business entity capacity. And so um, I read it as just as not being an association. So if we're good with referring that. Well, I, I had, uh, since I misunderstood the first time and I thought you were saying Clay County, um, and you were saying Clay County Rural Development, I, you know, I didn't come down on granting them a hearing. Um, just because uh, I, I happen to agree with ED and, and OPIC that um, I believe OPIC recommend, recommended denying a hearing on, on them. And if that's incorrect, please correct me. But uh, I didn't I didn't see enough in there. It, it looks too speculative to me to say that they might be affected so um, that's why I didn't come down that way but that's that's where I am <laughs> and that's that's fine um, Commissioner now, if you Janeka, both agree that they should go for an affected uh, you know I, I'm, I'm comfortable moving them on for an affected determination I think or referral uh, sounds particularly where we're mixed on on our findings on on where to move forward for that particular party uh, but I'll go either way I, I don't I'd, see the harm in it. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say let's keep going down the list um, and make sure we're in agreement on the rest of them. Okay. And, uh, I mean... I, Maybe we come back to that. Yeah. We don't need to resolve it right now. Yeah. I have pages of analysis <laughs> exactly. left. Exactly. There's a lot more. <laughs> okay. Um, I did want to note with respect to Ms. Essler and Ms. Klein um, that I view their request as being timely because they were filed before the, the close of the August 25th, 2020 public meeting. And um, with respect to water use permits, I read sections 55.152 and 55.251 of our rules to extend the public comment period to the close of any public meeting. So again, that would be August 25th. And with that deadline, um, we would be compelled to deny as untimely um, several requests, including uh, Grayson Gaither, Jenica Lambert, Michael Davidson, Taiwan Tremaine Savage, and Patricia Reynosa Nava. And um, so I would deny those. Uh, Margaret Bivens request was timely to the August 25th deadline, but she failed to identify a personal justiciable issue, interest rather, so I would, um, I would deny her request I'm in agreement with that. All right, and if we're all right, uh, let me turn to the hunting leases. So hunting lease is a, is a contractual property access interest uh, that we encounter from time to time. More commonly, we run into alleged recreational interests, and this is, in my mind, akin to a very well-documented recreational interest, which is sufficient for an effectiveness determination if it's coupled with articulated concerns that are relevant and material to the to the application. Um, I thought that Joshua Don Ferguson met these requirements. Uh, he expressed a concern uh, about wildlife in the area, so I'd grant his request. Um, Clint, uh, uh, I think I have a typo here. Staley. Staley, thank you. Uh, Clint Staley uh, didn't, did not express concerns relevant to the application, in, in my view, he expressed concerns uh, not about fish or wildlife, but about Indian campgrounds and burial grounds. So uh, he did not quite make that hurdle, in my view. Uh, Tim Birch and Jake uh, Robertson stated no concerns. So I would deny those three requests. I, Mr. I, Staley, Mr. Birch, and Mr. Robertson. 
I agree with you on Mr. Birch and Robertson. I, I came down differently with Mr. Staley, and I failed to see the connection in his uh, hunting least interest, showing that he's clearly got a little more than just the general public in terms of impacts and connection with the land, but where he turns to express his concerns on an issue that don't apparently seem related, I, I didn't see that as necessarily disqualifying. That, sure, I'm, I'm comfortable moving, moving him along on that basis, and I thought the, the comments were at least uh, a little more, a little more specificity there relative to the the other two names that you mentioned, and so that's where I drew my dividing line. But I'm I'm comfortable either way. So what what were the comments that that you honed the, in on? The the campgrounds and Indian burial grounds. I, I like you. I think I saw no obvious and logical connection. But right. I think having a hunting lease that also, you know, that that's part of his concern. I think that's there. There is at least an obvious. Uh, potential connection that that seems like it could be borne out more in in the so accord if appropriate so i'm not uh, i'm not quite saying he didn't he didn't raise enough specific concerns relevant to his uh, his use so i'm good either way with him okay commissioner lindley and chairman your recommendation was to deny his uh, deny his because i didn't see that he had articulated a uh, an interest that's yeah, yeah clearly articulate an interest that's connected to a relevant and material issue. I think uh, Indian burial grounds and campgrounds um, are are outside of of our jurisdiction on this application. Is another way of saying it. You know, fish and wildlife considerations. You know, very much so. And so, uh, Mr. Ferguson, I think, nailed that with his um, expression of cons ex expression of concern about wildlife. But I didn't see that the other three had quite made um, that threshold. I I'm fine denying. That's that's okay. fine with me. Um, all right, um, and I and I will say, kind of implicit in all this is that we, as we always do, we're we're, we're pretty demanding in in asking mm -hmm. requesters to to articulate their concerns. That's a, a line that we you know draw uh, over and over again. Um, you know, even though somebody might infer you know that they have a hunting lease that they would be. Concerned about wildlife yeah. in the area. In the area, we've we've just you know s elected to use a bright line and and really ask requesters to to spell it out and be explicit with us. So, I agree. Um, all right, moving on. Um, that takes us to the associations, um, and I agree with the executive director and the Office of Public Interest Council that the National Wildlife Federation the Texas Conservation Alliance, the Texas Wildlife Association, and Texoma Stewardship Coalition have met the requirements for being granted a hearing, um, including identifying a member who has standing in their own right. I would also include um, the Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. They didn't, they didn't quite get there on their initial request, but I think they rehabilitated their request by identifying members who would have standing in their own right, including uh, both Deborah Clark and Emery Birdwell, among others. I'm in agreement on this. Okay. Um, as for the Henrietta and Clay County Chamber of Commerce, there's, there is an argument that its purpose, which you know part of their purpose they state is civic welfare. There's an argument that that is germane to issues relevant to this application. Um, I didn't see that the request made that connection um, to relevant and material issues, at least in a way that is, uh, that's personal and not common to the general public. So I would deny that request. I agree. Likewise. Okay. Um, next, we had multiple requests made on behalf of Clay County Farm Bureau. And I didn't see a connection between the group's purpose and an interest relevant to the application in a way that's not common to the general public. I think there, there could be a personal justiciable interest, but as I mentioned before, it's, it's something that has to be stated. Um, and so I would deny their request. Um, I would also note that, that, that uh, the Clay County Farm Bureau identified Randy Maddox as a member who would um, have standing in their own right to perfect their right to ask for a contested case. I have questions about Randy Maddox, but I'll, I'll return to those later. Um, but in any event, I would deny that request. Agreed. Okay. Uh, the Quail Coalition failed to identify a member who would have standing in their own right. 
Okay, so we'll deny that one. Um, Clay County has made the necessary showing to be entitled to a contested case. It articulated, among other concerns, the impoundment's direct impact on county services, and they listed a few, so I would grant the county's request. Agreed. Okay. Um, Henrietta Independent School District expressed concerns about enrollment and acreage taken from the tax rolls, and in my view, these concerns are a little bit too speculative and, and a little bit too tangential to the, uh, to the subject of the application to establish a personal justiciable interest, so I would deny their request. Agreed. Okay. Um, next, we have uh, Sherry and, and Luke Halsell, whose property is upstream of the proposed reservoir, and Luther and Darlene Lied, whose property is more than two miles below the proposed reservoir. Um, they, they all express concerns about flooding and inundation, and given their locations relative to the proposed reservoir, I thought that these concerns were too speculative to establish standing, so I would deny the, those requests. Agree. Okay, next we have um, Pamela Maddox Payne and Mary Ellen Maddox, whose properties will not be inundated. And I thought that their concerns were too general to be um, considered a personal justiciable interest, so I would deny those requests. Agreed. Okay, we have a similar set of requesters who live too far from the proposed reservoir to establish a personal justi justiciable interest and describe concerns um, that, are, that are common to the general public. So I would deny those, and that list is as follows. Haley Greer, John Greer, Katie Greer, Leanne Greer, Dr. Thomas David Greer, Adeline McDonald, Caroline McDonald, Jan Greer McDonald, Joe Parker Jr., and John Cox. So I would deny those requests. All right. Um, Ken Scott does not provide an address and fails to state how he was negatively affected. Lively Ranch does not provide a property location, uh, nor does Kelly Dean Yandel. Uh, so I would deny those requests. And the same go f goes for Deborah Clark's request on behalf of the unknown landowners. I think we're granting her, her request in her individual capacity, but not on behalf of the unknown landowners. Um, all right, finally, we're good? One more, Randy Maddox. Um, the, the, the facts were unclear to me. It looks like he may have sold his property. He may have retained certain rights in it. Um, I couldn't sort this one out, so I would recommend that we refer his request to SOA for an effectiveness determination. Uh, I'm comfortable doing that, yeah. Likewise. Okay. All right. Can I ask one yeah. question? I apologize. I'm not sure which grouping you would have had it in, but uh, we discussed the Staley's. Um, and I wasn't sure what your recommendation, I, kn I know what it is for Carol Staley Morrow. Well, and, and you were wanting to, I guess let me just clarify, you were wanting to grant her hearing request, and she also takes on the role as the executor of the Staley Family Trust and the Melva Jove Staley Estate. That's her full long title. Right. That was your intention to grant the whole in, in that capacity. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to double check. Confirm. I'm good with that. Good. Okay. Um, I think there were two that we had questions on that we need, needed to sort out. Um, Clay County Rural Development. Clay County Rural Development. Um, For the effectiveness. <clears throat> and again, th so they had their two properties. In my mind, it was, you know, kind of an open question factually about whether they were would be affected or not. Um, so. <laughs> I, I take your point where they're asserting direct ownership of those properties as the basis of their effectiveness. That's not necessarily following the association route. So I follow you. I've since simmered a little more on the, the comment you made about that. So I, I, I think I strongly agree. I'm very comfortable referring. I might not strongly agree, but I will. You can support a motion. I can support a motion. With yes. referring them. Okay. Yes. For um, effectiveness, yes. All right. So that takes us to uh, Clint uh, Staley. And um, and again, I, I didn't think he expressed an interest, so I would deny his request and 
I'm, I'm, I'm fine with denial. Counting noses. I, yeah, I would exclude him from the motion. Okay. Um, I think I've... All right. Well, that's, that's the parties, which I think was the, the uh, heavy lifting um, on hearings, contested case hearings for water rights. We um, were not required to identify the issues. We simply refer the application as the language in, uh, in section 55.255A3. Um, the ALJ is certainly free to limit the, the scope of the hearing, including on motions by the parties. The parties can, can stipulate uh, the scope of the hearing. So I think we stay out of that and leave that up to, to SOA. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I think we're ready for a motion. And um, I would be happy to read one since I that sounds good to me. put together the analysis already. Um, so are we ready? I'm ready. OK. I move that we grant the hearing requests of Emery Birdwell, Deborah Clark, Shane and Casey Cody, Laura Del Murray, Joshua Don Ferguson, Mark Hill, Stan Horwood, Larry Horwood, Lonnie Horwood, Kildevnet Castle LLC, Carol Staley Morrow, executor of the Staley Family Trust, and Melva Joe Staley Estate, Jason Obermeyer, Jimmy Dale Obermeyer, Johnny Shaw, Joe Staley, Phil Staley, Gil Staley, Umhale Valley LLC, William Wellborn, and the Wellborn Ranch Limited, the City of Henrietta, Clay County, the National Wildlife Federation, the Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association, and the Texas Conservation Alliance, the Texas Wildlife Association, and the Texo Texoma Stewardship Coalition. I would refer the hearing requests of Francis Esler, Sharon Fitz, Edna May Klein, Randy Maddox, and the Clay County Rural Development LLC to SOA for an effectiveness determination. I further move that we deny all the remaining hearing requests and that we refer the matter to SOA for a contested case hearing on the application. A second. All right, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next items. That brings us to our enforcement docket, which is items four through 23. The executive director staff is here to present these matters. Good morning. Good morning, chairman, commissioners, general counsel, and public interest counsel. For the record, my name is Melissa Cordell of the enforcement division, and with me today are Susan Jablonski, also of the enforcement division, and Gitanjali Yadav of the litigation division representing the executive director. Pending before you are items four through 23. The total assessed administrative penalties are $592,180 with $118,905 deferred, $86,937 applied toward supplemental environmental projects, and $386,338 to the general revenue. We respectfully request approval of these items and are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I've got a couple on item 13. We have a motion to continue on that item. And I wanted to begin with just asking, what is our understanding of the state of that, um, of that property? This, this concerns a MSW violation. So this is a default order that involves a violation of a prior agreed order for unauthorized disposal of tires and unauthorized outdoor burning. Between the first and the second case, the number of tires has doubled. So it was about 3,000 tires for the first case and above 6,000 the second case. And we have not received you know, any communication or documentation of compliance. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, my next question is, 
can you describe the efforts to communicate with the respondent and work with the respondent on this item? Certainly. We always try to avoid a default situation, so we had sustained communication both by the enforcement division and the litigation division. So in this case, um, while the case was an enforcement, the enforcement coordinator called the respondent on December 8, 2020, and spoke with the respondent who indicated her husband would call the EC back. The enforcement coordinator then mailed a proposed settle agreement to the respondent on April 7, 2021. Then the enforcement coordinator called a second time on July 13, 2021, spoke with the respondent's husband, um, explained the process, requested compliance documents, and um, the respondent's husband indicated a willingness to settle, but the enforcement coordinator did not hear again from them. So the enforcement coordinator mailed the settlement termination letter to the respondent on August 5, 2021. The case was referred to the litigation division. The attorney assigned to the case filed a petition on October 29, 2021, and the green card was signed by Linda Mossbacher on November 2, 2021, so she had actual notice of the petition. Um, at that point, 70.105 allows 20 days for a respondent to file a hearing to prevent a default. Um, during that time period, the, re the attorney assigned contacted the respondent and left voicemails on November 18th and November 19th, explaining the process and leaving a callback number, but the attorney did not hear back from respondent. And then again on February 7th, 2022, a 10-day letter with a copy of the draft default order was mailed to the respondent, and it gave another 10 days to allow for an answer to be filed or to settle the case uh, to prevent the default order from being issued. And then the notice of the agenda was mailed out on March uh, 25th, 2022. All right, thank you for that. And the lawyer for the respondent is signed in to speak. I'll invite him up to, to speak in just a minute. But colleagues, I want to check with you to see if you had any other questions on, on any of the items, including item 13. I don't. Uh, question in my mind, and I don't need to hear it right now. I'd love to hear from the, from the attorney for the respondent here, but it, it's if uh, th is there any alternative path here or is the the appropriate and consistent uh, pathway that the agency typically handles orders that come up to the to the fault point is it uh, inconsistent for us to remand and try to find a route to an agreed order at that point or is that um, that, that would just be my question which one's more out of character for us least least frequent least uh, least utilized tool in our agency's box but I don't I don't need to hear uh, right now, if we can hear from the um, attorney, I'd, I'd like to return to that topic. Uh, or That's where my, my head is at in this question. I'll just answer from my own experience. You know, normally, if they get to this stage on a default order, um, we, we enter the default order. Um, but, but we don't have to do that. We could continue this item um, if there's a compelling case. Um, I think at this point, we'll invite um, Mr. Malaski up. Um, lawyer is the lawyer for the respondent um, in the room or on online? I'm online, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Mr. Good morning. Hannah, I'm sorry. Good morning. I'm, I'm no, both. I answered a commissioner. Yeah, good, good morning, sir. Uh, go, go ahead when you're ready. Well, first of all, I don't know exactly why uh, my client has not done more. She does have health issues. And I'm not so sure her health issues don't have some impact in terms of her focus, uh, because as I indicated, uh, the heart condition, she's in heart failure. And as I understand it, as a woman, sometimes that can impair, uh, at least impair your sometimes your ability. Let me give you just a little background because it's relevant. This is rural property where she had allowed her son to live. Unbeknownst to her, he accumulated a lot of tires. Now, they has, there have been, and I don't think this shows anywhere on the, the documents that I have, which are very minimal, uh, that there's been a substantial cleanup. In fact, they've spent a lot of money. I don't believe the CCEQ or any governmental entity has had to spend any money on cleanup. And if it's, there's some tires left that need to be cleaned up. But I would also point out to the commission that it cost them $3 a tire to dispose of it properly. And one of the things when I talked to the attorneys for um, 
the executive director, they pointed is that they want to see the receipts of where these things have been properly disposed. Uh, on short notice, I just have one receipt here. I know there's more, uh, and we can document substantial cleanup. So I don't understand when we got to the default before I was contacted, and I can't, I can't speak to that. But given the fact that we've already done a substantial cleanup, and I know there's been some fines we paid, and I certainly think that it's probably uh, appropriate. I've just asked that we move this to Jan, excuse me, June the 1st, so let me get more information so that y'all can make an appropriate decision. Uh, you know, $100,000 for an elderly person in poor health, that's going to be life-changing. And if she hadn't done anything and they hadn't done substantial cleanup, well, then I wouldn't have a very good argument. But they have. And so instead of really putting them in a precarious situation, I've, given the fact that they've worked hard to comply, I think uh, moving it this hearing until June the 1st to allow me to get with the relevant uh, members of enforcement, finish getting this thing cleaned up, which I'm sure is our ultimate goal, uh, would I think be the best course of action. It would be fair and it would accomplish what the commission is trying to accomplish. Thank you, Mr. Mulaski. Colleagues, any questions? No, thank you. No, I appreciate hearing that. Thank you, no questions for me. Uh, I have a question for, for staff, and that is that is there, is there any benefit or what would the benefit to the public be of continuing this item? I'm, I'm guessing that your position would be to, to oppose the motion. I haven't heard that. Um, you can answer that question as well, I suppose. We would oppose the motion. Um, up to this point, we've repeatedly asked for compliance documentation and have not received it. Um, that opportunity has been given to them, and they could have provided it to us, and it was not. And it's been an, a year and a half since we first began asking for those documents. And even before that, um, you know, this timeline doesn't take into account the fact that orders are tracked by the enforcement division. So that documentation of order compliance with the initial agreed order was being asked for. So it's even beyond that time period. Thank you for that. I just have one quick question. Um, how did this come about? I mean, was there a complaint received? Or, you know, I'm just curious how this all even started. The initial case was the result of a complaint. Okay. I guess I'll just say this now then. I, uh, I'm comfortable uh, moving forward and adopting what's before us today um, and, and not granting an extension. I'm just not, while I, I think the attorney is correct, yes, what we want is compliance, right? That's what we always want, and we want the site cleaned up. Um, I'm not sure extending the, I, I'm just not sure what it gets us going, moving this to June or a later agenda. I think ultimately uh, we still need to adopt the order, so. Let me, invite Mr. Mulaski to add any comments he'd like to. Well, I'm not so sure if they have a $100,000 fine, I'm not sure how they can afford to keep paying $3 a tire to clean it up. I mean, if we really want the cleanup, that's what we're here. And what I'd like to be able to present you, even though the enforcement division has this whole list of things, They've never once talked about when going out there and seeing that there has been some cleanup. And I'm a little concerned that maybe that needs to be fleshed out before you make this decision, that there has been a diminution in the amount of tires and also the amount of money that my clients have paid to clean this up. Basically, we have something where a mother gave a place for her son to live, and this is the thanks she gets. And she's paying the price, not the guy who put the tires there. And that's the real injustice of finding her $100,000 when she's cleaning up something she did for her kid. I hear you. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Seeing nothing. nothing. Mr. McWhorter. Um, I agree with the position of the executive director. Um, in, given the past history, it seems there's been plenty of opportunity to show compliance in 
to the extent there's any question about the ability to pay the penalty, I assume they've been given the opportunity to submit that documentation also. Um, so I would support moving forward with the default. Colleagues, I agree with that. I think it's, and I'm in your camp, Commissioner Lindley, I think it's too little too late on this. Commissioner Janeka. I think I arrived at the same place. I would far prefer to see uh, a, an agreed order before us of a lower, lower dollar amount that maybe allowed some of the finite resources, if there are finite resources in this case, to really be applied directly to clean up. Uh, however, we're, we're uh, as much servants to the process as the public expectations that drive that process. So I think it's appropriate for us to move forward with the matter as before us. All right, I think we are ready for a motion then. I would move that we adopt items four through 23 as recommended by the executive director. I second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next items. The Commission will be taking up items 24 through 27 together. They are the consideration of the publication of and hearing on the proposed Howard County, Hutchinson County, and Navarro County Attainment Demonstration State Implementation Plans for the 2010 Sulfur Dioxide National Ambient Air Quality Standard, and the consideration of the publication and hearing on proposed new subchapters E, F, and G of 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 112 the control of air pollution from sulfur compounds and corresponding revisions to the state implementation plan. The executive director's staff is here to present these items. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, chairman, commissioners, general counsel, and public interest counsel. On behalf of the executive director, I'm Donna Huff with the Air Quality Division, and with me today are Terry Salem and John Mentor of the Environmental Law Division. For your consideration today are items 24, 25, and 26, the executive director's proposed state implementation plan revisions addressing attainment demonstration requirements for the 2010 sulfur dioxide SO2 standard in the Howard Hutchinson and Navarro SO2 non-attainment areas. Also for your consideration today is item 27, the executive director's proposed rulemaking to amend portions of 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 112, control of air pollution from sulfur compounds to provide control measures to attain the 2010 SO2 standard in the Howard, Hutchinson, and Navarro SO2 non-attainment areas. Staff respectfully request permission to publish the proposed rule in SIP revisions, solicit public comment, and hold public hearings. Thank you, and we're available to answer any questions. I don't have any questions. Commissioner Lindley. No questions. Commissioner Janeka. Not at this time. Ms. Smith, has anyone signed in? Um, we have people who have signed in, but um, aren't requesting to speak. All right, and Mr. McWhorter, what do you think? OPIC recommends approval for publication of and hearing on the proposed Howard County, Hutchinson County, and Navarro County attainment demonstration state, implementan state implementation plan revisions for the 2010 one hour SO2 National Ambient Air Quality Standard as presented by the executive director and we also support uh, approval for publication of the chapter 122 subchapters in support of those revisions. 112. 112, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, th thank you, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, I think this is a necessary step to improve air quality in these counties and comply with our Federal Clean Air Act obligations. So I think it's appropriate to move forward with the proposal. I agree. Likewise. I think we're ready for a motion. I move that we approve the publication of and hearing on the proposed attainment demonstration SIP revisions for the 2010 SO2 Howard County, Hutchison County, and Navarro County non-attainment areas and the proposed new rules in 30 Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 112, as recommended by the Executive Director. I second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries.
I'm so sorry, Terry. Can I try to restate? It's a little out of order. I, I regret not taking the opportunity when I had the moment to grab the mic. I just want to restate that last item in plain English. We very slowly and deliberately uh, bounce back and forth with the federal government and our, our state knowledge of the air sheds and, and different attainment areas in our state. And they've directed federal requirements at us that we're now proposing to impose and, and ratchet down existing sources. And so I'm, I'm really, I want to reiterate what you say and just state it more simply. We're, we're slowly but surely improving air quality in our state in, in the pace that the federal government expects all states to do so. So appreciate staff juggling a lot of disparate and very technically complicated pieces there. But I, I don't know how to say that more simply and, and more understandably for the public, but I really appreciate us doing that. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'll add my thanks to the staff. They're fantastic. I don't say it enough. I'll second that. <laughs> and when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number 28 is our public comment session, and currently we don't have anyone signed in to speak, um, but we'll pause in case there's anyone who wants to address the commission. All right, hearing nothing, I don't see anybody racing to the podium, so I think we can call the next items. The next items, 29 through 32, are for executive session, and the commission will not meet in, in executive session today. And with that, the time is 10.20, and we are adjourned.